please welcome Leonard Malarna, theoretical physicist from the University of California. He's um, at Caltech. He's a writer. He uh, was the co-author of uh, Grand Design with Stephen Hawking and also the uh, co-author of the uh, Shorter, oh, brief, briefer, briefer, briefer history of briefer time. Briefer history of time. So I had forgotten about that book. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> sit down, Len. So here's a little bit of a, a backstory. Uh, a while ago, I was invited uh, by Michael Sharma, who's going to be one of our speakers, uh, for a debate, actually. And the debate was called The Future of God. And uh, basically, it was about two worldviews. And uh, it was going fairly well till, uh, till uh, the ABC reporter pulled out um, Leonard from the crowd and he said, do you agree with Deepak? And um, Leonard said, you could use a little bit of physics. Um, I don't agree with the metaphors. You're being too liberal with physics, right? And um, he offered to teach me physics. And I thought, if he can teach me physics, maybe I should attempt to teach him consciousness. And so we both uh, agreed to do a book together, which some of you may have seen. It's called War of the Worldviews. And uh, uh, it gives you two completely different views of reality, universe. We talk about the origins of the universe, we talk about evolution, we talk about life, we talk about God. Um, all these things are addressed. And um, um, as a result of having written the book, Leonard and I became really close friends. And we traveled the country together. And we learned a lot from each other. You know, I would ask him about how does the curvature of space time create gravity, and he would. I remember that at Penn Station, you actually, he took a, a, a piece of... Uh, uh, actually, I think I was just using my finger on the tiles. On the tiles <laughs> of Grand Central Station, he explained to me um, how space-time curves. Um, in any <laughs> case, we traveled and uh, uh, we decided to change the title of our book now. Uh, it's still called War of the World Views, but it no longer says science versus spirituality. It says uh, where science and spirituality meet and do not. So I think in the first few minutes, can you say from your point of view, you know, what the basic premise was in um, the grand design and what the laws of nature are? Oh, okay. The laws of nature in a nutshell, yeah. Uh, do, Why not? Uh, this uh, the one minute. Where the are one, they one written? Year, where are they written? I want to know where the laws of nature are written. But Deepak, they're in your consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you knew that. <laughs> okay. Well, the point of the grand design was um, to answer the question: um, uh, What are the laws of nature? Where do they come from? And how did the universe get here? And also to talk about. Um, how we know, at least the scientist's approach. Uh, so, um, the, um, our answer to how the universe got here comes from quantum theory. We, we, I, I'll say up front that uh, we di don't know how quantum theory got here. So, uh, and, and I should say that, that even if I said we know how quantum theory got here because it came from schmantum theory, we wouldn't know where schmantum theory came from. <laughs> And then you could ask where that came from and so on. So let me just start by saying that, that even if physics uh, can tell you where the universe came from uh, and, and says that we don't need a creator to explain the universe, um, that doesn't mean that we've explained everything because physics by definition starts from laws. We could talk later about how we get those laws, but it starts from laws. And if we have an explanation for where those laws came from, that explanation is other laws or Einstein wanted to uh, explain that using pure logic and mathematics, which it doesn't seem like we can do. But even if that were true and we could, then, then it would, we would say it came from this theorem of math or this principle of math. It always comes from somewhere. But the physical universe, uh, as we talked about in our book, doesn't have to have a creator because quantum theory tells you that 
uh, what we think of as nothingness, that is if you go out in space and you make a big box and you take out all the matter and all the energy from the box, the box won't st still won't be empty in the sense that there will still be things coming in and out of it very quickly, too quickly for you to catch them, but very quickly. And they have, they'll have a certain energy and, and the, the, um, that quantum theory tells us that nothingness is a, really more of a boiling, bubbling cauldron of things that we call virtual particles that are coming in and out of existence extremely quickly. And uh, this is not, I guess as they would say in Kansas, just a theory. Uh, like people, look, there you go, Michael, thank you. Someone, um, uh, it's something that's been uh, measured to uh, 10 or more decimal places. In fact, every calculation in modern physics, it has to do with elementary particles that you read about in the Large Hadron Collider or in our other colliders uh, that, that, that um, have to do with um, the fundamental forces and particles of nature have to take into account this fluctuations, vacuum fluctuations, we call them. And furthermore, most of your weight is due to them, okay? Because you're, you're made up of mainly of uh, protons, protons and neutrons, and, and inside those uh, nucleons are quarks, but the weight of the proton and neutron is not mainly from the quarks inside it, it's from these vacuum fluctuations. So these are very well established in physics, and what quantum theory tells us with, with certain technical conditions that I won't get into that is that our universe itself could have come from nothingness as, um, as, as one of these fluctuations. And so that was really the basis of the book, The Grand Design, but uh, we, we tried to explain in that book um, what, what is the nature of a law, uh, what is the nature of a law of nature, uh, why we think this, um, and also we describe what the laws of nature are, but I think that probably that's uh, a little bit too much detail for now uh, to get into what you know, the different forces are, but, but the main point was that the universe could come from nothing, uh, however, I do want to put that little asterisk, but, the law, but, but, but that's, that nothing includes quantum theory. <laughs> so. Is that nothing the potential for all things? Um, I don't know what that, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that. So the potential meaning, so that nothingness, uh, things can fluctuate out of the nothingness. And so if you want to call that, say that the nothingness has potential, uh, in that sense, you could. Does that nothingness have the potential for the human brain in this conversation? Well, if the, if the universe all came from that, then, then again, you would say that, that, that it must have had the potential because we're here, aren't we? So, how do you define potential? Well, how do you define potential? That's, that was what confused me because you used the word. <laughs> potential is the possibility. Well, I think that we're possible. The fact that we exist is good evidence that we're possible. <laughs> to to like, kind of bastardize what Descartes said, I guess. And, and <laughs> therefore, uh, the fact that we exist uh, because of very precise laws, right? Right. Uh, precise to a decimal point, right? Uh, well, uh, so I think what you're getting at is one, one thing we the talked about in the book is the fine-tuning uh, uh, of, the, of the laws of nature. And um, so it turns out that, um, okay, so I will say that there's four forces in nature that we know of. Uh, gravity, uh, the strong interaction in the nucleus, the weak interaction in the nucleus, and electromagnetism, which used to think was electricity and magnetism. We thought they were separate. 19th century, uh, it was discovered that they're one force. And then actually around 1970, it was discovered that the weak force and the electromagnetic can also be united into one theory. And uh, so we have these forces um, of nature. And they govern how the, uh, the large-scale evolution of the universe and also the, uh, also the small scale. But I mean, for what's important to us is they govern the large-scale evolution of the universe, which led to galaxies and stars and the creation of the elements that we're made out of, carbon, oxygen, uh, from the lighter elements that, that, that appeared uh, with the creation of the universe, like um, hydrogen and helium. So um, these laws uh, made it so that the, uh, this primordial universe turned into uh, stars, planets, and, and beings like ourselves that are made of these heavier elements. And what it turns out, if you, uh, if you tweak the laws of physics a little bit, the, the st strength of the electromagnetic force, the mass of the electron, uh, the strength of the strong force, um, the, all the different parameters that are, uh, that, that are in our theories uh, of those forces, if you just tweak them by sometimes half a percent, sometimes five percent, it, it causes a, um, a change in the laws so that 
if you then go through the uh, calculation to see what kind of universe will we have, we'll find a universe that doesn't have us here. So that's called the, the fine-tuning in, in physics. Why are there laws? Do we know why laws exist in the first place? No. <laughs> okay. Does, does science say, can science say that God does not exist? No. So, okay. I'm just Okay, Deep, yeah, thanks. Deep. Okay, so we've Deepak's done, referring we've to... We've done this before. Yeah, we've done this so. before. So, on, um, when, I, when the grand design came, came uh, out, uh, uh, I got a call from uh, Stephen uh, Hawking uh, from his office saying, we need help handling all the press. I'm going, what press? This is a physics book. A and uh, he said, oh, haven't you seen the headline in the London Times? Of course, I live in California here, so, so I know I hadn't seen the headline in the London Times. But I went back and looked it up, and it said, um, it says, uh, Hawking, colon, uh, God did not create the universe. And that's not what we said in the book. What we said was that God wasn't necessary, or a creator wasn't necessary to create the universe. But physics cannot say, doesn't say, won't ever say that, that uh, God doesn't exist. And that's a question that's outside of the realm of physics. Do we have free will? I, I don't believe that we have free will, as you know. <laughs> and and uh, the reason I say that is that I believe that uh, all of the physical universe is governed by the laws of nature, governed by the laws of physics. You're talking with Manus about... The, you, by, um, the laws, uh, physics creates, chemistry creates, biology. So, so uh, as a scientist, uh, I've seen that through history and, uh, and everywhere we look in our laboratories and we do our experiments and we make our theories and we make our predictions to 10 decimal places, the theories always explain uh, the phenomena, have always explained the phenomena, and we've never had to say, then a miracle occurs. You know, there's never this gap where it must be something bigger. And, of course, I can't predict what I'm going to say in a minute, the next minute, neither can you, no, 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 no neuroscientist can say that. And so that seems to be beyond the reach of our current science. But I, I believe that the laws of, uh, of course, I, I don't believe that we'll ever be able to predict what I'm going to say in the next second from quantum theory or classical mechanics, uh, because there's just, there's um, 100 billion neurons in my brain and each one has thousands of connections and that's, I think, too complicated a system. Uh, to predict from the fundamental uh, f uh, physics what's going to happen, but I do believe it's governed by that, and you have laws on a higher level that, that you try and study that are chemistry and biology and explain how your brain works. And so I believe that all that follows, and that the brain uh, uh, and all my behavior follows from the laws of nature. So if you believe that, what is free will then? I mean, it, 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 can I... Uh, um, am I if, if I go like that, am I really deciding to go like that? I feel like I'm deciding, so for me that's good enough. I feel like it's free will, but I believe that if 10 seconds before I did that, you had the big enough computer and, and you knew all the laws of physics and you knew exactly where my hand was and how my neurons were all set up, that you could have ground through uh, that mathematics to predict that I would do that. It was, it was determined by the laws of nature and not by something outside of them. Or to state it another way, um, let's say that I did have free will and I, and I could make it so that it didn't happen. So that would mean that, that the laws of physics are describing all the molecules in my body and that somehow those laws didn't, didn't apply because uh, they, they were predicting I wouldn't do that and I, yet I did. So those laws were violated and I don't believe that the laws of nature are violated by, you know, it, it within us. So that's why I, I don't believe Do you in think uh, uh, quantum uncertainty gives a little wiggle room? It gives, so quantum uncertainty, of course, would give a lot of wiggle room in terms of, uh, okay, there's two levels. There's, uh, so there's two, one level is to say, am I a quantum uh, being? Okay, I don't believe that I am, and, and uh, most uh, scientists believe that with classical physics, which is the, what happens to quantum physics of all the jiggling of all the little atoms when you've got a zillion atoms is called classical physics. That's Newton's laws, that's the physics that lets you build bridges and cars and airplanes, and you never need to use quantum theory for all that. So I don't think that we're quantum beings, but let's say we are. So let's say that that has a major effect in my body. What does that mean? Does that mean I have free will? And it, it doesn't, because what quantum um, physics says is that uh, if, if you had done the calculation of, uh, based on my state of being uh, uh, back then and projected 10 seconds forward, what it would do is give you a, a set of probabilities. Will I do this? Will I do this? Will I do nothing? And it would say, ah, oh, this, this is 30%, this is 30%, this is 40%, something like that. It would all add up to one. 
And, 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 and what would happen is uh, one of those would happen 10 seconds later. And if you'd had, and quantum theory says if you had a zillion of me, let's say you, a zillion, let's say you had a, uh, a, a billion or um, uh, let's say you had a million of me, and I said, what did I say? I said 30%. So that would be um, 300,000 times. If you had three, a million copies of me, 300,000 times I would have done that, you'll find. Or if you make me in the laboratory, let's say, 300,000 of me would do that, uh, 300,000 of me would do nothing, and 40%, 400,000 would do that. So quantum theory says I can predict the future in terms of these probabilities, but it doesn't, still doesn't give me a chance to pick which is going to happen, because if you had a zillion copies of me, you would find those exact percentages played out, those probabilities played so, out in the world. So you would agree with Daniel Dennett that we are zombies? Robots. I don't know. Well, well, I've, let's, this is potentials again, no, if, Deepak. If we have no free will, then we are robots, right? Okay, so if the definition of a robot is someone who, who, who feels that he has free will, yeah. Like, I, if it is me, but I'm governed by the laws of physics, it's then, then I think I'm term. a robot. The term zombie is a technical... A philosophical zombie, yeah. though, is... is, yeah. is, is, is so, so that is not exactly that, I think, though, because that means that that, that that describes a being uh, that, doesn't, that, 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 that behaves just like a human being but doesn't feel anything, mm -hmm. right? It's like... And, and I feel stuff. Qualia. That proves it. That proves it. I feel that. Yeah. I felt that. I really did. Yeah. And, and so I'm not a, I'm not a, a zombie. So a philosophical zombie would be someone who did that, winced, said I felt that, but didn't feel it. So you can't really tell whether I am or not, but I can. <laughs> you can only tell whether you are or not, right? That's, again, going back to Descartes. So, as usual, the arrow of time is compromising us right now. But um, uh, can we ask you one last question. You, I'll be, I'll, I'm yours, Deepak. Okay. <laughs> so, did you learn anything about spirituality on our tour? I did. I learned a lot, and I, I, and I thank you for everything you taught me. Uh, and from Deepak, I, uh, what did I, I may learn so many things, and I appreciate, appreciate it all, and, and um, I appreciate our, not only uh, where I get to teach you physics, but uh, the other side where you teach me uh, spirituality and uh, meditation, for instance, and, and um, I guess uh, the the biggest thing I learned from you is uh, is uh, how we're all connected. So so we have different views on consciousness, uh, but I have learned to look more into myself and how I'm connected to others, and, and whether it's through a collective consciousness or just by being people, I've learned to be more cognizant of that and to think about that more, and to think about myself more. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Leonard.